A leader needs to think about what's in the best interest of the country. What's in the best interest of the country is not to have an 80 year old man sitting in jail that continues to divide us. What's in the best interest of the country is to move on as a Worrying about me your pop music when it's written in your head Oh, it sounds like the code is through the weed And now you're helping on the bed Another billion dollars, now you're begging for a shit Oh, space inside is comfortable To a lazy spot is with the sky They represent the life that continued on And the time has been away in the notice And the before could pass the time From one place to another Where the found or picked up the soap For the mind to the mind And far away from the earth And even here in the temporary The smell of the insect was welcome In the mind of a boy to listen For the footsteps of the intrusion and the yard passed the by that I will never ever see the echo And it wasn't gonna happen Here I got here, but not as near as it could 
the thrill of it all, photograph, head covering cocoons. Long ago we had a one chip And what a words to a parrot if you got the equipment to charge Order 500 to the cot, no wonder it Get it towed into the mangroves, running around, killing a million crowds, 
with you every time now. Ass all cut on the giant No holy mercy. It's like never People had been worked on Than a first world real estate seller We got what you needed And we could wrap an hour He's no closer to me Never big enough to the world We need to sell you things To sell you things And you go to Need them. The Kabobos look very well when you're in it. How about a place of poverty to have to start? Cash can only go so far. Don't put it down so soon. Look what we can do to turn off this shit. So long you can't help. Turn off these sound vibes. From Trump, they never tire of 35 minutes to go. Maybe I heard I'll cover Relatively totally on the scene. Don't really found the secret here. You must be more curious than eight billion. Knowingly invited him over to your house. Avril Lavigne. I mean, no one at Cape Canaveral is thinking more than retirement. There's a nice few somewhere out there in the world. I'm trying to find out, like, you didn't realize that was going to happen. And the smell of the cheese and the smell of the cheese and the fuel.
had to put up with this InfoWars character uh, pretending that their children hadn't been killed, and the whole thing was a scam. There was no way that they could stop his bullying and his noise until they got him into an honest courtroom. And suddenly he has to write them enormous checks and shut up. And so, and of course, Jean Carroll is another example of somebody who was going to be a victim of bullying until she got into an honest courtroom. So I think we can have some confidence that honest courtrooms can remedy some of the bullying and the lies that is now endemic within our political system. But at the end of the day, that gets you to a Supreme Court that has to be willing to follow the rule of law and uh, not be subservient to political interests. Senator, with that in mind, uh, the court, Chief Justice Roberts just quietly released their end of year report. Magically, it doesn't seem to talk too much about ethics or the massive, massive, massive ethical lapses that we've seen brought forth by ProPublica and other outlets this year. Um, what can this government do? What can the Democrats do? What can President Biden do? What should be done now to Convictions 
during a period in which tens of millions of votes were cast. 76% of those defendants whose race and ethnicity could be identified were black or Hispanic or white people constituted 24% of those who were prosecuted for something like... Welcome to Heaven for a Manager, brand name ambassador, conquistador. You told me you got nothing on the belly of you. In and out of trained up like a jack of trend so shot. Calm from lack of protein in the high chicken. Ready for the contest conquest. Dreaming of Arnold. Dreaming of Arnold. Dreaming of Arnold. Dreaming of Arnold. If Kevin Basie put as much work to grind, it'd be harder than G.I. Joe and Tom Cruise. Together building up deltoids of Scientology. Signing in, in, signing in, in, signing in. in. Not I'm worried about expiry in the freezer anymore. Back to the down, spend the ball. What's your summer in back in your head? Transacting code to another billion. We got the spice. Yeah, we didn't find uh, any. There was no data that I was able to, to uncover that showed enough voter fraud that could have altered any election result in any state that we had. To the campaign's yeah. credit, as we worked our way through this, the lawyers I reported to were interested in the truth of the matter. They mm -hmm. accepted what I told them. They brought my information to Mark Meadows, and they told Mark Meadows, who was Trump's, Trump's chief of staff at the time, that no fraud was determined that the campaign okay. could find. Uh, so, and Brad, they had you the box of the bell. Box of the bell.
do not even think it was his fault. A new poll from the Washington Post and the University of Maryland found that only 53% of Americans and just 14% of Republicans, one four, think Trump bears a great deal or a good deal of responsibility for January 6th. Those numbers are down significantly from the last time the poll was conducted in 2021. Joining me now is Michael Fanon, former DC Metro police officer who was badly injured by the insurrectionist mob on January 6th, 2021. Um, Michael Fanone, it is great to finally have you on the show. It has been a long time coming, so thank you so much for taking the time. And I just want to get your reaction to hearing that that is what Americans now think. They agree with Tucker Carlson that the people who were attacking you were peaceful, ordinary, meek. Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it pisses me off to no end, but I also, uh, I understand. Uh, um, you know, when you have uh, people like, you know, uh, presidential candidates, Republican presidential candidates, governors, members of Congress, elected leaders, you know, people that hold positions of authority in this country telling their constituents lies and BS like you just heard, uh, you know, then that's, that's going to be the end result. People are not going to know the truth about January 6th, the reality of that day the experience that so many police officers like myself had um, battling with these violent insurrectionists at the Capitol. Let me let you listen to some young voters. These are some voters who were at something called America Fest, which is Turning Point USA, which is that right-wing organization. Uh, they held something called America Fest, and this is what young voters said about the insurrection. Yes, I think January 6th might have been an inside job. If you watch some of the footage, you can see there's several people who have like microphones in their ears who look like feds, and they're also trying to get riots started. I don't think it was an insurrection. There wasn't much violence. I do believe it was an inside job because the capital security should be some of the best security in the country, and these people got in with ease. I mean, the Capitol security should be some of the best security in the country. You were not a Capitol Police officer. You were called in because they were being overwhelmed. Where do you think this idea comes from, that this was somehow done by the feds? You were there, and I think it's pretty clear to you that this was done by civilians, or some, in some cases, people who were actually law enforcement or military, but not- I mean, those, the, those, idiots, those idiots that you just played uh, are just, repeating the lies that they've heard, uh, you know, their masters within the Republican Party um, echo for the past three years. Uh, tonight, they're attacking the Secretary of State of Maine, Shanna Bello. She is a Democrat, but the process in Maine is that the first stop for any questions about whether someone is eligible to appear on the ballot, go to the Secretary of State. Now, in their appeal tonight, they argue that she was, quote, a biased decision maker who should have recused herself, had no legal authority, made multiple errors of law, and acted in an arbitrary and capricious manner. Anderson, her decision was based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Now, this part of the Constitution and who should enforce it, well, these questions have been litigated now across multiple states. Colorado and Maine opted to remove Trump from the ballot, but the other states, largely on procedural grounds without getting into the merits, have kept him on the ballot. But they've also left open the possibility that this could be litigated through the general election. So Anderson, unless the Supreme Court really steps in here and provides some guidance to the states on the meaning of this section, this is an issue that could hang over the entire 2024 race. When do we expect the, Trump to file his appeal in the, in the Colorado case? Well, Anderson, I've been on the phone uh, for a large part of the day trying to get an answer to that very question. Uh, what I can tell you is it's been two weeks since Colorado Supreme Court removed Trump from the ballot. And in that decision, they gave a deadline of January 4th for an appeal to be filed. They said, look, if someone files an appeal here, then this will be stayed, will appear on the primary ballot until the Supreme Court weighs in. Now, Trump has not filed his appeal, but the Republican Party of Colorado has filed an appeal, and that has been recognized as staying the case. It's expected that he will appear on the primary ballot. He is also expected to file his own appeal in that case, but it's unclear when. Now, again, two weeks 
have passed by. That's a lot of time because while many people do expect the Supreme Court will weigh in here, Anderson is not clear how quickly they will do that. And there was pressure building for them to give some clarity, at least, before Super Tuesday. Yeah, Paul Reed, thanks very much. Joining us now is Maine Secretary of State, Shannon Bellows. So, Secretary Bellows, what is your response to this appeal from the Trump team, particularly the accusation of bias against you? Well, good evening. First and foremost, people need to understand that this is the appropriate process is for Mr. Trump to file appeal in Superior Court. This process was initiated when five registered Maine voters brought a challenge to Mr. Trump's qualifications after we had approved his signatures for the ballot. Under Maine law, those challengers were entitled, as was Mr. Trump, to a hearing, an administrative hearing over which I was obligated under the law to preside and issue a decision in a very tight time. Now the next step is Superior Court, which Mr. Trump has filed with tonight. Now with regards to the accusations of bias, I think it's really important to know my sole obligation is the oath I swore to uphold the Constitution and to follow me in election law. I was duty bound by main election laws, which require this process of holding a hearing and issuing a decision to ensure that every candidate on the primary ballot meets the qualifications of the office they seek. I did my duty, now it goes to the court. That's why I stayed, suspended the effect of my decision, pending court appeal. And I will uphold whatever the courts determine is appropriate. So their claim that, that you had no authority under any main statute to consider the federal constitutional issues presented by the challengers in this case, you say is simply not true. Exactly. Article 1 of the Constitution delegates to the state authority to administer elections, and state legislatures may delegate that authority to the Secretary of State, which the main legislature has done under Title 21A for the legal gates at home. And under that process, I am prohibited, whether it's placing an 18-year-old on the ballot or a non-citizen on the ballot, or someone who's served two terms like Barack Obama or George W. Bush, or someone who does not meet the constitutional qualifications of the office. And Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is not an option. Constitutional qualifications are not a menu. If I was duty-bound to hold that hearing and issue a decision, and that right. will determine the former president, though, is saying that he always, he's also taking issue with the process, claiming he was not given adequate time and opportunity to present a defense. That is not correct. So this is very clear in my 34-page opinion, which is on the main Secretary of State website for those who may wish to read. So this hearing followed the process under main law, the Administrative Procedure Act, which mandates, and I quote, that all parties present, be able to present evidence and arguments on all issues and then at the hearing to call and examine witnesses, to make oral cross-examination of any person present and testify. Mr. Trump was afforded those opportunities at the hearing. So how quickly do you think this would make its way through Maine's court system? And, and would you be opposed to the U.S. Supreme Court intervening sooner rather than later? We would welcome the U.S. Supreme Court making a ruling I will uphold whatever the courts determine and acting quickly to resolve this, I think is in the best interest. That being said, our process in Maine is it goes to Superior Court. Mr. Trump has filed that appeal tonight. The Superior Court uh, under statute must rule by January 17th. And then it can go to the Maine Supreme Judicial Court and to, then to the US Supreme Court. We're on a very compressed timeline and that was part of the requirements under statute. I was required, once the challengers filed that challenge, within five days of certifying signatures, they had to file that challenge within five days. I had to hold that hearing within five days and issue a decision within a week of the conclusion of the hearing proceedings. Madam Secretary, I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. With us now, senior contributor, former Nixon White House Counsel John Dean, also former federal prosecutor Jessica Roth. She's currently teaching at uh, Cardozo School of Law here in, in New York. Um, do you buy what she says legally? 
I thought the way that she laid out what her responsibility is and authority is under Maine's law uh, was very persuasive. And I read her opinion, uh, it's a lengthy, thorough opinion, which is also quite persuasive on what the authority is that's delegated to her um, under Maine law to make decisions about who actually is qualified to be on the ballot once there has been a challenge lodged, as there was here. And so what she has said is she is required to determine whether somebody, in fact, is qualified, and that includes the requirements under or the disqualifications under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. So she did hold the hearing that was provided by Maine law, as she sets forth in her opinion, as she repeated tonight. She provided the process that that statute required to the former president and to the other side uh, during that. And uh, th there's no suggestion of what in particular he was deprived of the opportunity to present by way of evidence or argument. She gave him every opportunity, including to supplement at the end of the hearing. So I haven't seen anything persuasive from the Trump side about how he was deprived of the opportunity to present specific evidence or arguments before her. The larger question that looms here, as in Colorado and in the, all the other states, is under the US Constitution, do states, whether it's delegated to the Secretary of State as in Maine or to state courts, have the authority to make these determinations under their state law of who's qualified or not? Those are questions that the US Supreme Court is going to have to decide. And John, do you believe the, the former president's argument that the Maine Secretary of State doesn't have that legal authority? It's, it's not clear at all that she does not have that authority. In fact, in, under the main uh, law, it's clear she does, as the professor pointed out. Uh, and Trump really is just throwing everything he has against the wall to see if anything will stick. Uh, it's that kind of very brief, very broad uh, uh, attack on her decision making. So I, I don't really expect it to go very far. Uh, Superior Court's a middle level court. It'll probably go to the Supreme Court of Maine uh, to resolve some of the issues if the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't intervene first. I mean, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, I mean, the sticking point of this is it does not specifically mention the president as, as one of the, uh, the, 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 the officers prohibited from seeking office. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why the trial level court in Colorado found that Trump was not disqualified. Um, the Colorado Supreme Court disagreed with that. I mean, do, do you, where do you stand on this? Because, I mean, the argument is, well, you know, they mentioned all these other people who can't, it would seem that the president would be with somebody who couldn't do it, but it doesn't specifically there's say so. a very persuasive argument that actually the presidency is covered. And there's actually two parts of the Section 3 um, that, that are implicated here in terms of the person who takes the oath as the president, whether that qualifies as an office covered by Section 3, and also the office of presidency in terms of what you can then be elected to. I'm persuaded by the arguments that the presidency is encompassed within that section, but of course there's so many other legal questions involved as well, including what is the definition of insurrection for purposes of Section 3? Did Trump, as a factual matter and a legal matter, engage in insurrection, however that is defined? And then also this question of do states and the state courts, the Secretary of State, have the authority to make those determinations or is that something that only, let's say, federal courts can decide after a conviction for insurrection and pursue it to legislation enacted by Congress? These are all open, novel, legal questions. And as the Secretary of State said, the US Supreme Court really needs to settle those. But in the meantime, the decision makers who are authorized by their state's laws to make these decisions have to act. They have to make those decisions in the interim. John, I'm sure you saw the goose of US v. Nixon hovering over the question of whether Trump has immunity for basically anything he did while president. How do you expect that this particular Supreme Court would rule on that? This, I don't think this Supreme Court wants to face that issue, frankly, uh, and they might try to avoid it. I, I, I see no basis for the kind of immunity that Trump is calling for. It would be unprecedented. It would be contrary to the rule of law. It would uh, define, redefine the American presidency, and it would have made Nixon uh, an innocent man. So uh, I just don't think it's going to go anywhere. It's an overbroad attack on, on uh, the rule of law. So my feeling is the Supreme Court is not going to buy it. Do you think they should? I think that on the law, on the merits, that the Supreme Court should rule against Trump's claim of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution. In terms of a prediction of whether the 